Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisette Coley, and I serve as the Executive Director of Parapsychology Foundation. And on behalf of our Board of Trustees and our President, Mrs. Eileen Coley, I welcome you here to the Eileen Garrett Research Library. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Stephen Bauman, is a neuroscientist and parapsychologist who over the past 20 years has performed numerous studies of brain function using e EGs, right? <laughs> I'm so technological. And MRIs. He's currently a cognitive neuroscientist and project director of Psychology Software Tools, Inc. He's also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Duke University and a visiting research associate at the Rhine Research Center. Steve is a past grantee of Parapsychology Foundation, and we are very pleased to have been able to offer him a measure of support for his very fine work. As you'll soon agree, while listening to his discussion of his studies of the mechanism of psychic healing through the examination of the physical and psychological relationship between healers and their patients, we are sure to enjoy tonight's presentation, Studying Physiological Coherence Between Alternative Healers and Patients. Dr. Bauman. Okay, good evening. I'm going to wander over there to the uh, overhead projector in just a minute and show you a bunch of transparencies. But please feel free during the course of the talk to ask questions so that we can have uh, a dialogue, a discussion. Uh, some of what I'll talk about is uh, a bit technical. And if you don't understand that, uh, you can ask questions or just let me blow on by it and I'll try and get to the stuff that may be more interesting to some of you. Um, I don't know what your backgrounds are. Uh, is anybody in here involved in uh, uh, the physical sciences, engineering, mathematics, physics? Uh, how many of you are involved in the arts? And how many of you are involved in uh, uh, the social sciences or, the, or psychology? Okay, so that's the preponderance. There's nobody involved in, in the physical sciences. So I, I won't try and uh, do any in-depth explanations of uh, some of the techniques we're using. Um, yes? I'm, I'm extremely interested in that. I, I've got lots of transparencies. I'm going to go through all of them. Uh, and if you have questions about uh, what I present, don't hesitate to ask. But I'm not going to dwell on the mathematics of this too much. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about this. Um, in talking to healers over many, many years, I've been fascinated um, about what they do and how they do it. Um, I believe there are certain gifted people who can genuinely perform what most of us think are miraculous healings. Those people are the virtuosos of um, parapsychology and, and healing. Um, how they do it uh, is right now beyond the realm of uh, conventional science to explain. But I believe there are tools available uh, that we can begin to use to try and understand the mechanisms of this. So I've tried with uh, my colleagues to bring to bear some of the, the better tools. And those are uh, recording uh, physiology from people and uh, healers and patients simultaneously because uh, lots of healers claim that their ability to uh, do a successful healing on a person is uh, a matter of their entering into a relationship with that person. Um, it's sort of an energetic dialogue. And if they're able to establish a rapport, then they feel like they can be more successful. Uh, so the patient has to allow themselves to open up to, to be vulnerable. Uh, and to perhaps have some exchange of energy. This is not all healers, but this is uh, quite a few. So in thinking about that, if there is a rapport set up or some sort of resonance, the, the mathematical analog of that is called coherence. And 
hence that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. So one type of healing, and the main type that I've been looking at, is laying on of hands. And here's a healer treating a patient. They're both wired up with electrode caps, so I can record simultaneous brain waves, uh, as well as heartbeats. And this is when the healer was treating the patient, uh, and then the bottom picture is when they were uh, resting. That's the control period. Now, there are other types of healing I realize. Uh, and Jane Catra has written a couple of books on this, trying to define some of the types of healing. Laying on of hands is just one. There's spiritual healing um, that may not involve any energetic exchange and may not involve healing in the way that the patient and the healer necessarily intended. It uh, may involve more of a spiritual transformation. That could lead to healing of the patient's ailments or not. So one way to approach this is to, to look at coherence, and that involves looking at the frequency content of signals. So I'm going to give you a little background information on the frequency content of signals. What do the signals look like? Well, this is a recording from a 20-channel system uh, from one of the people in the dyad, the healer and the patient form a dyad or a pair. The top 19 channels are EEG, they're brain waves, and the 20th channel at the very bottom is the electrocardiogram. And it's the peak of the R wave right here. And that's important uh, for reference later on. So just re this complex <coughs> for the ECG is P, Q, R, S, and then a T wave following it. The peak of the R wave is a good time point as a reference for when the heartbeat occurs. You notice some of the structure of the EEG uh, that there are bursts of these slow waves. Those are alpha bursts. And they occur predominantly in the back of the head, in the occipital lobes, O1, O2. Uh, but they also spread up along the temporal lobes. T6 is on the right side, and PZ along the midline. Um, when there isn't an alpha burst, there's a lot of this high frequency, meaning occurring fairly rapidly, and low amplitude background signal in the brain. Now, since everybody's brain is uh, very similar, um, you might suspect that a lot of the frequencies are the same, and that, that's true. So if you were to compare signals from two different brains, you would see a lot of similarity. And then if you look at the, the resonance between the brains based on the, the frequency content, you're going to see some baseline level of similarity as well. But what I'm going to be talking about is analyzing the different frequencies here. This alpha bursts, if you look at one second here from zero to a thousand milliseconds, that's one second, we can actually count the number of cycles in this alpha burst. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about ten. So there should be a lot of power or energy at 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second, when we do uh, a transformation of this uh, in the frequency domain, as it's called. Uh, similarly, there's going to be less energy at the higher frequencies, but you do see some higher frequency stuff in here. That's beta rhythm. So, Physiological signals can be analyzed on the basis of their frequency content, how much power or energy there is for each possible frequency. 
And that's the underlying basis for the coherence calculation. All right, some physiological signals I've already mentioned, the brain and the heart. We can also look at skin conductance response. What I'm going to talk about tonight is primarily on the EEG and the ECG. But there are a variety of electrical signals from the body that, that could be measured. So a little background here on uh, frequency analysis and coherence. So alpha bursts uh, occur anywhere from 8 to 13 cycles per second, 8 to 13 hertz. Beta frequency is higher than that, and there are subdomains to uh, beta. But simply as an example here of how coherence is calculated, we have two signals here. The red one is occurring at 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second. So this is one second across there. And here's the amplitude. They're both at the same amplitude. And then the green one's at 20 hertz. They're sine waves. If you add those two together, and that's what's done in this second picture, you can see that they're superimposed again here. And then the blue one is the summation of those two in the background. So you just try and focus on the blue one down here. That's what the summation looks like. That looks a little bit like a brain wave. And indeed, brain waves are the summation of lots of different frequencies. Some at 10 hertz, some at 20, some at 11, 9, all over the place. And if you did a frequency transformation of this signal here, you would get two peaks. There's frequency on this axis, power on this axis. You'd see two peaks, one at 10 and one at 20 hertz. Now we can take brain waves and do the same thing. We can break them down into their component frequencies and get lots of little spikes showing up. And the amplitude of the spikes is a measure of the power at that particular frequency. So coherence, this is the only equation I'll show you, but <laughs> is uh, what's called the cross spectrum over the uh, self spectrum or the auto spectrum. We're looking at frequencies. So we're going to look at the power of one signal, x, versus another signal, y, at a variety of frequencies. Um, we take the absolute value of that and square it, and that's divided by the self power at each frequency for each of those signals. What does that give you? It gives you a number between 0 and 1 for each frequency. And that measures the correlation between the frequency content of each of these signals, x and y. x from a healer, y from a patient. So we're breaking down <coughs> some biological signal, in this case a brain wave, into its component frequencies, and seeing if there are common frequencies between the healer and the patient. Think of a tuning fork. Uh, if this is approach I've been giving you is a little too difficult, the tuning fork resonates at a certain frequency dependent upon the mechanics uh, and the geometry of that tuning fork. You bang it, and it will resonate primarily at a certain frequency. If it's A, it might be, what, 440 hertz, I think. So it resonates 440 times a second. Uh, there are some other frequencies at much less power. But if you bang a 440 hertz tuning fork, you get this And the dominant frequency is at 440. So you'd see this big spike there. And then you'd see some other spikes probably at multiples or submultiples of that uh, in the frequency spectrum. What if the brains are sort of like tuning forks? And if there's one frequency that's dominant in the healer, 
are they somehow able to impart that to the patient? And do you get some sort of resonance set up between these brains that is involved in the healing mechanism? It's just a hypothesis. Yeah, Bill. I'm not entirely clear. A little basic question. What is producing, you're banging a tuning fork, what, what's producing the frequency in the brain? So what exactly is producing that 8 to 13 cycles a second? What exactly is producing that? What's producing the, uh, that? The basic brain rhythm is produced by populations of cells that may have pacemakers underlying them. And these populations of cells are communicating with one another at certain frequencies. And there are a variety of pacemaker cells in the brain that give you your, your underlying circadian rhythms, your underlying cellular rhythms, your brain rhythms, etc. Is that what is that what you're saying, that it's just the brain rhythm between the healer and the patient that's making it go off, like, like you know, making the frequency, is that? No, no, I'm, I'm, I don't know. No, that, okay. Um, I'm saying that there are underlying rhythms in everybody's brain based on simply the fact that you're a biological organ, is that, like, is that like biorhythms, like each person yes. has a different biorhythm? Yeah, each person has slightly different dominant uh, bio frequencies in their brain. Uh-huh, and that, you know, that it depends on the frequency in the brain. Is that, what you're, is that what you're saying? It depends on the frequency in the brain? I'm saying that there are a number of biorhythms in people. Mm -hmm. Some of those biorhythms uh, exist in your brain, too. And... Perhaps one means of a healer imparting healing to a patient has to do with these rhythms from different people resonating. Maybe the healer sets up a resonance in, in the patient somehow. And that resonance is a mechanism for transferring energy, is a mechanism for inducing uh, better rhythms that help the immune system. Could that cure almost about anything from like, you know, like from Alzheimer's to like, um, to like depression, like people who have bipolar and serious illnesses? Could it, is it a wide range of spectrum? Could it cure certain things? Don't know. Yes. Um, how do you, it, when, when we bring into um, like a healer working, let's say on an inanimate object, uh, like uh, somebody using PK skills to, let's say, melt a piece of metal, or uh, a healer uh, working on, uh, let's say, a non-human, uh, a horse, for instance. I've witnessed a healer uh, shrink a tendon uh, in a racehorse in five minutes by maybe two centimeters. Uh, just witnessed it. And the horse is, knows what's happening and turns around and looks, and then one realized that it was a benevolent force and allowed it to happen really quickly. Uh, but the, uh, and then I noticed in the horse, the heart rate speeding up uh, momentarily for maybe like nine, maybe nine seconds really fast and then calming down. So, um, you know, I've witnessed what you're saying, you know, the, the, the relationship, the healer tapping into the brain of others and then they're, they're sinking. But I've also noticed that between healers, uh, other uh, dogs, uh, horses, other types of animals, and also, uh, I have uh, knew, knew what this really amazing, uh, Healer who uh, was an American Indian, we would walk out in the field and he would say, "There's a there's a bird hot hiding in that bush," and he could tap into the consciousness. And we'd walk up and a, and a grouse would fly out of the bush, so he could tap into that consciousness and he could do it with horses, birds, animals, deer. And mm -hmm. So, and I've also know healers who, who can levitate things and also and spoons and do all this kind of stuff. So, but um, you know, I, I do agree. But how do you how do you explain that this is happening with also inanimate objects and also uh, it's, it's, yeah. I, I agree with you, but, but I'm saying it also happens with animals. Okay. Yeah, animals are biological organisms as well. <clears throat> they have uh, rhythms. Some of the rhythms are, are similar to uh, human rhythms. Uh, this is simply a hypothesis. I don't uh, purport to be able to explain all parapsychological phenomena with this. And this hypothesis is an outgrowth of descriptions of what healers do from the healers themselves about entering into a resonance. And so we've tried to approach this uh, with uh, 
sort of an engineering and, and mathematical analog of, of resonance, which is coherence. Yes? Are you going to talk about whether you tested the healer before their brain waves, or their general waves, before they began the healing process and then during? Yes. I mean, right. I'm just trying to set it up. I'm trying to set up the data for that. <laughs> so, when we do the coherence calculation between a 10 hertz and a 20 hertz sine wave, we get zero, essentially. There's nothing uh, in common uh, between those two. If we did the same thing with 10 hertz and 10 hertz, we'd get a spike at around 10 hertz. All right, so that's the background. Um, the method I is to use uh, electrodes uh, over the head, either with electrode caps or with larger arrays, uh, little sponges on the head that pick up electrical activity from the scalp. And when we do the coherence calculation, remember all those 20 channels I showed you earlier, lots of little brain waves and ECG at the bottom. This is what we get. You see a big spike here. That's right around 60 hertz, which is the power line frequency. It's shifted over one hertz here because of the calculation. But this Big ringing at 60 hertz is expected. If you hook up two pieces of equipment that are tied into the power line, there's a little bit of background hum. Bzzz, same thing you hear from fluorescent lights sometimes. And this is a way of making sure, it's a check, that the coherence calculation is done correctly. We should get a big spike at 60 hertz. The rest of this, we pretty much don't pay attention to this side because a lot of, some of this, can be an artifact of what's over here. So this is the area of interest. You see that there's a big peak right around uh, this low frequency of one or two hertz. There's a background uh, low frequency content in the brain. And then most of the rest of the coherence, and this is an overlay of 128 channels of data. All the channels are plotted on top of one another. Most of the rest of it's between about 0.35 and uh, point 0.4. And that's what other people have reported. So once again, that leads me to believe that we have been doing the calculations correctly. So even if you take two unrelated brains who weren't involved in the same session, you're going to get a calculation for coherence between this electrode on one person and the same electrode site on another person. That's going to give you something around point 0.35 to point 0.4 because the brains are made from the same basic tissues, the same molecular components, doing the same thing. So this is a, I'm going to overlay now. This is from uh, treatment period. This is from a control period. And there is hardly any difference for this particular pair. That's after the treatment has begun and stopped, not prior to any treatment beginning? Or? This was taken during the course of a treatment, which lasted uh, 20 minutes. This was taken during the course of a control period that lasted 20 minutes. I guess what I wanted to ask you is, um, had the healer already met, was the control period prior to them meeting? In this case it was, but it was determined arbitrarily by the flip of a coin. So in some healers, they started the treatment period first and then the control period. And in some healers, we did treatment control, treatment control, Yes. I wondered if you also took some subjective data from this. Did you ask the patient if they had felt a difference from the healing? Yes. Okay.
Yes, and most of them said yes, they had. So the middle spike is an artifact yes. produced by electrical noise in the equipment. That's right. Has, has nothing to do with the, with the data. That's correct. The, and and the the relatively consistent bar that's the combination of all the frequencies. That's from just the fact that their brains are operating at about the same uh, rate of cycles, and so, so some of the time they're going to match up just just by chance. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Excuse me. Yes. What kind of conditions did the patient did the patient have? saying that they were treated and they feel better, what kind of conditions did they have? You know, what was their condition? Oh, well, some of them uh, were suffering from uh, manic depression in one case, cancer, arthritis, uh, heart disease. Uh, some of them had been to uh, conventional physicians and uh, were still very sick, and so they were coming to alternative healers. So, so thus far, are these negative results? We're seeing like the control, or, or, or is this the... Right. This would be a negative result. It doesn't, doesn't bear out the hypothesis here. Uh, this is a, a crude way of doing this because all of the data has been averaged together. Uh, a better statistical approach might be to look at smaller segments and do a one-by-one one comparison for each second in time. Is there a significant difference in this one second interval of time? And then you can add up the number of times when you have a significant difference versus the time when you don't have a significant difference. And that's what I have yet to do. Um, I'm showing you a work in progress. This data has not uh, been completely analyzed. Um, there is a lot more to be done. And the reason for, for doing that type of statistical analysis would be under the assumption that it's not something, this resonance that occurs may not be something that happens the whole 20 minute uh, treatment period. It may be something that just sort of clicks in place for brief periods of time. And maybe that's all it takes. Maybe it's like a switch. If you are somehow able to connect with a person and get in there and, and turn a switch, Maybe you turn on their immune system the right way. Maybe you, you stop the cancer from growing. So maybe it isn't something that occurs over a long period of time. Maybe it's just a short burst. Yes? Uh, does this data uh, give an implication that, or uh, kind of this doesn't sustain the concept of every healing is really self-healing, and that a healer, uh, like a doctor, is supposed to be there to just help along, help an individual along to heal themselves? That's one uh, way of looking at it, yes. And in fact, that's what a lot of the healers say, that it's not really them doing it. They're just uh, either God's acting through them and it's, a, it's an energy that goes out or they're just tuning into the, the patient and helping their, uh, the, the patient's biology act more correctly imparting some band of frequencies that, that gives them the correct imprint. That turns the switch on. Yeah, that turns the switch on. But then again, in, in my observations, uh, a healer could, let's say, tap into the consciousness of another individual, and that person will be healing that the healer is not cognizant of the healing that, that they're receiving. One instance of something I observed, uh, to a doctor brought in his daughter who had a pulled groin muscle, who was a a juvenile in, in a gymnast. Uh, a healer treated the tendon, the tendon relaxed, got warm, and got range of motion. The doctor called the healer the following day to say that the doctor's daughter had been suffering from bulimia and stopped that day. So the healer was not aware of what was treated. But in the other instance, a, a, hit, a healing I witnessed the other day in Bryn Mawr, um, uh, was a gentleman working on somebody who had uh, terrible gout in his feet, and the healer announced, First, I'm going to remove all the gout in your left foot. And did it, and in front of all the people in the room, all the, the huge gout just shrank to nothing. Mm. And the other foot was, was all swollen. So the, 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 even though the healer claimed that it was channeling the divine energy, he was still driving where the divine energy was being focused and what change was, what change was going to happen. So, um, so it can be done randomly, uh, in my experience, or it can be done site-specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just something I want to share. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I wonder, are you planning to go over the results of, um, of the MRIs versus the EEGs? Yeah. Things like that. I just wonder if there was a difference between. Yes. Okay. Get to it. <laughs> yeah, there are two main sets of data here. One is the, well, three. One is the EEG data. The other is the ECG or heart beat data. And then the third is the functional MRI data. All right. So onward here with the uh, ECG or EEG. So if we look at a difference between those two plots I just showed you, um, this is the control period of time. You see that there, at lots of frequencies there's an, an increase in uh, the coherence little spikes here other times there's there's a decrease if we look in here and this is during a control period of time um, uh, looking at the excuse me a treatment versus the control doing a subtraction between the two um, but nothing that at this point I can claim is uh, anything consistent from between uh, the healer across different sessions with people or uh, across different healers. Nonetheless, what it says is that when you subtract the average coherence in the treatment period from the control period, there are little peaks in here at a variety of frequencies that stand out, which means that maybe some more refined method of doing the statistics here will bring something out. All right, another measure is the heartbeat. If we take all of those peaks of the heartbeat, the R waves, the top of the QRS complex, uh, and measure the time between each of the R waves, uh, we can get the, the interval between them, and we can convert that to uh, the heartbeat in beats per minute. And so that's what's over here on the y-axis, the heart rate. Um, and down here is just the interval number, the number of, of heartbeats. And what we see for this particular healer during the rest period is an average heart rate of around 88 and a quarter beats per minute with a standard deviation of around two and a half. So the mean for this is in green here and the standard deviation is these two lines. And if we look at his heartbeat during the treatment period, what you see is the means very much the same. It's 88.7. The standard deviation is a little greater, but we also see that there's this curious rise here, rise and fall. So that might be an interesting portion of the data to look at. Haven't done that yet. So this is a work in progress. So now uh, I intend to go back and look at the EEG during this period of time a little more carefully. Were there any controls where two people who were not healers were in physical contact to see if the heart rate would spontaneously entrain just to them you know, embracing or holding hands or something like that? Yes. And I didn't see that. I haven't analyzed all that data yet either. So there there are 20 pairs of folks who were involved in this study so far. I'm still interested in working with more. Uh, and I have analyzed only a portion of that data. And one other uh, claim in the literature by at least two independent groups is that in some instances, uh, you can pick up the person's heartbeat uh, in the other person's brain waves. Um, it's not uncommon to be able to pick up heartbeat artifact, ECG artifact, in one's own 
uh, scalp recordings because this is a huge electrical signal being pumped out of the heart here. Uh, anywhere from 20 to um, 100 times bigger than the brain waves. So it, it spreads all over the body, including up on the scalp. And you can see that in this data. What I've done here now is take all of those R waves from the healer and average them together and average the EEG at those time points and for 100 points around it. So this is the 19 channels of EEG. It looks pretty smooth except for this little ripple right here. And that's the artifact from this big average heartbeat occurring in each of the scalp electrodes. So it does spread up there and it's time locked uh, in the, the person's own scalp. What about transferring that big heartbeat over to another person? Well, that is outside the bounds of what uh, physicians accept as, as normal. There is no good explanation for it, although I don't know anybody who's tried to do the electromagnetic calculation, and we may end up doing that this summer. But what we see when we look at this transferred potential is that we couldn't pick it up. Uh, when we average uh, at 100 here, that would be where the, the healer's heartbeat is averaged. And then look at the patient's brain waves and heartbeat. It looks like a bunch of random scatter. There is no little ripple that occurs in the patient's brain waves at that point. Despite the fact that the scale here is about 60 times bigger than it was here. Okay, so I haven't done a lot of that yet. There's a lot more of that data to analyze, but that was discouraging too. So those, those two approaches so far have not revealed anything, but I, I want to emphasize that there is a, still a huge amount of data to analyze. Yes? I was just wondering if this is in reference to Gary Schwartz's yes. work in heart math. Right. Okay. Yeah, those are the two other so sources. You so you didn't find what they said not so to, far. Bear, to bear out? Not so far. Not bear out. Yeah, right, but I want to emphasize once again that I still have a lot of data to analyze. I mean, if I can't find it, then I'll go visit them and find out what it is they're doing that I'm not doing. So now I'm going to talk about the functional MRI work. So this is a magnetic resonance uh, imaging scanner, widely used to look at uh, the internal organs of the body, the internal structure, including the head and the brain. And to do that, a person lies down on the bed and puts their head inside this head coil. And then the bed is slid into the bore of the magnet. And MRI uses uh, very strong magnetic fields, about 30,000 to 60,000 times uh, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, standing field, and radio frequency waves of um, 64 megahertz here to put energy into the uh, water molecules, the hydrogen atoms in particular. And those resonate. And they're, they're bombarded. They resonate. Uh, the bombardment stops. And then they give off some energy. And that energy is picked up. And from that, you can take all sorts of neat pictures of the brain. Beyond that, though, you can also look at the function. This is just the anatomy. For all you know, that's a dead person. This person is alive, we know, because they were able to do a task, and that task activated a certain area in their brain. If you're shown a flashing checkerboard in the visual task paradigm, that's going to activate your occipital cortex back here, where you process visual stimuli. And this is three orthogonal views. This is looking at the brain sagittally. This is frontally. 
and then this is an axial plane here, all showing that activity in three different views. If you do a motor task where you have to uh, tap your fingers, that activates the motor cortex bilaterally if you're using both fingers. Functional MRI has now turned out to be uh, the workhorse of cognitive neuroscience. It's the primary tool used to study the brain these days. Uh, it's uh, supplanted uh, EEG and, uh, and brainwave recordings. So we decided to try that, to try and use a functional MRI study to study a healer and patient relationship. And you have to excuse me a minute, these are out of order. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk while I sit and, and rearrange these. What we did is um, analyze data from three different recording sessions um, done um, over a year apart, the, the first and second one were done uh, a year and a half ago, and then the, the third one was done just a few weeks ago. And in the first two sessions, um, there was widespread activation when one looked at treatment versus non-treatment period periods of time. This is called a block design. The green intervals are when the healer was treating a person. The gray intervals is when the healer was not treating. So it's on and off. And then you notice that all these colored areas uh, appear. And if you highlight one of those with a rectangle, you get this sort of on and off uh, cycling. So there's increased activation during each of the treatment periods in comparison to the control periods in the healer. Um, but you also see that there is activation in the eyeballs, which is suspicious. And not only that, but there's increased activation at certain times and decreased activation at other times. Uh, well, that's very suspicious um, because that could mean that the eyes are moving. So what we did is go back and study little movies of these eyes and see if they were moving in sync and that's precisely what we found and the activation in the eyeballs is huge it's uh, the signal increase is approaching 20 percent which is really unheard of for functional MRI studies usually talk in terms of a few percent, one, two, three percent. And you can see, in fact, that you get negative activation during treatment periods and positive during control periods when you look at the eyeballs in that particular slice. So we went back and played movies of the, of the eyeballs and certainly you could see this, the shift for treatment and, and control periods. It was time long. And that happened in both of the first two studies. So uh, we were curious, though, because there is, there is this activation in the frontal lobe um, way up here and here that we couldn't discount on the basis of the strong eyeball movement. So we wanted to do it again. So we came back, and the next time, we asked the healer to look at some crosshairs and keep his eyes fixated to try and minimize eyeball movement so that we wouldn't have this eyeball movement causing this huge artifact that might contaminate any normal signal that was in the brain. That's still not right. All right, so we attempt to control the eyeball movement, and what do we see this time? Well, a lot of the activation has gone away. But there is some residual activation. If you look at uh, this area in the anterior frontal lobe, you do see uh, in a time course of control treatment, control treatment, 
an indication that um, it's following what we would think, that when the healer is trying to treat, he's uh, using his brain in that area more. However, there is some activation in the eyeball, and once again, the adjacent slice has some decreased activation, and it looks like there might have been an eyeball movement right here. However, be that as it may, this slice is well away from the eyeball slices, so it indicates once again that something may be going on in the frontal lobe during the treatment and control periods. Okay, so what does that mean? You might say, well, that's what you would expect. You'd expect the healer to be doing more and there'd be more blood flow to his, his frontal lobes or some part in his brain during the treatment periods versus the control periods. There's nothing unusual about that. So, anticipating that, we asked the healer to try and treat some patients who were in the magnet while the healer was 30 feet away in the control room. There were two patients he treated that day. Patients did not know uh, what the order of treatment and control was going to be. That was determined after the patient was in the scanner and couldn't hear us, and by the flip of a coin, we determined when the healer was to treat and when he was not to treat. And what do we get? Well, we see some activation. We see some activation in the anterior frontal lobe. This looks like the anterior cingulate and the orbital frontal cortex, which is towards the bottom of the brain in the frontal lobes. The anterior cingulate is an area that's involved in attention, uh, goal planning, um, but selective attention. Now, this effect is not big. If you look at the time course of the activation, there's some sort of cyclic behavior in here that I don't know what the origin is of it, uh, but I'm determined to find out. You also see that it's just a little bit bigger during the treatment than it is during the control periods. And if you average that uh, for these two periods versus these two control periods, you see that you do get an increase in the bold signal, as it's called, blood oxygen level dependent signal, that's at a peak of about 1% greater than the control period. Tried to replicate that a second run, and we didn't. And we tried a second patient, and we didn't see this sort of effect. And that's where we stand with the, the data so far. This is a highly significant signal increase. Yes, Ruth? Yeah, I'm just a little confused uh, about what was going on. Who was in the scanner, the healer or the patient? This time it was the patient. The previous, and the healer was in the console room or the room behind the console room about 30 feet away and the patient didn't know when she was being treated or not. Like distant, distant healing. Distant healing, right. Mini distant healing. <laughs> so we're looking at activation occurring in coincidence with when the healer was attempting to heal the person. Right. That? Yes. That's right. Is there any reason to think that the very powerful magnetic fields of this MRI magnet might interfere somehow with the dealing with energy? Well, that's what some of the healers were afraid of, and so they didn't want to get in there. Mm -hmm. um, but other healers are willing. It doesn't phase them. Um, and on the basis of this, I've been able to interest uh, at least one other healer now who was reluctant previously to try and participate. Yes? Um, I've heard anecdotal reports of other healers who, when they go into an MRI, um, they'll start moving around their energy, um, you know, maybe just, you know, playing around or whatever, and uh, the machine will start malfunctioning. I don't know. I don't know if that, that answers the question before. So, I mean, it, I think it can interfere um, if the magnetic fields around the body are strong enough. Well, they're, they're whopping magnetic fields, and uh, there is radio frequency energy as well. Um, but a lot of us have been inside these magnets dozens of times, and at least 
in our opinion, it doesn't seem to bother us too much. I, I know one physicist who works around the scanners has been in it hundreds of times. And there are no uh, reports in the literature uh, that indicate any long-term detrimental health effects from being in the scanners. That doesn't say that there aren't certain people who are sensitive to it and would be adversely affected because there's a huge range of the population. And there are certain people who seem to have some super sensitivity to electric and magnetic fields. And at the other extreme are able to affect electronic equipment adversely. Uh, sometimes they're unaware of it. Yeah, Mickey. I just wondered, what is the, would it that be in Melagos? And if so, what, what would you ask with Melagos to be at these magnetic fields? No, it's actually uh, 30,000 Gauss. So the Earth's standing magnetic field is about a half a Gauss. These are 1.5 Tesla. Um, so that's 15,000 um, Gauss, 30,000 times as strong as the standing Earth's magnetic field. So that's about it for the pictures. Um, and that's the current state of, uh, of where we are with this. We're interested in doing more studies. I certainly have a lot more data to analyze. And what I've showed you are, uh, is a sampling of it. There, um, there is some hint in some of the EEG from some of the healers that there is something usual, unusual going on. Um, but I don't see that consistently across all the healers or all the healing sessions with the same healer. Um, but there's an increase in the coherence at very high frequencies. Uh, for some of the channels. Um, I don't know quite what to make of that yet because I need to do some more analysis, but um, they're teasers in the data, just like this functional MRI data. It's sort of a teaser because we can't get it, we didn't get it to replicate uh, in a second run with that same patient, and we didn't get it to replicate in a second patient that same day. Uh, maybe, it, but Maybe it had something to do with just the healer wearing out. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's um, a very fickle thing to try and capture, as we know, since we've been working in parapsychology a long time. I have a tendency to not get these things to repeat as often as we'd like. <laughs> yes? Um, I have a, an acquaintance with a Vietnamese doctor and healer who had a very, very traditional upbringing, um, learned a lot of ancient languages that nobody speaks anymore in old Vietnam and so forth. And he said that in old Vietnam, uh, a husband and a, and a wife knew how to heal one another. Um, if the husband came home with a fever, the wife knew how to place her hands on his body in such a way to take the fever away. And I always imagine that he was probably talking about something like Reiki um, or some kind of energy mm -hmm. balancing thing. Uh, how would you compare a description like that with the kind of thing? Well, it's very similar uh, for some of the types of, of healing. Uh, some of the healers describe what they do as energetic healing, um, uh, like Reiki or, um, or Touch for Health or therapeutic touch, but even in the therapeutic touch community or the touch for health community, there's a divergence of opinion about exactly what they're doing. Are they imparting energy or are they turning a switch on or off or are they acting as a channel for uh, some spiritual energy? Uh, each healer seems to have their own opinion about what it is they're actually doing, despite the fact that they've gotten a, a similar background and a similar training. Yeah. Um, are there are there quantitative differences in um, like uh, in, in different healers with different you know beliefs about what they're actually doing? For example, do people who think that they're healing with energy heal um, better or worse uh, or more or less successfully than people who believe they're they're doing it? I, I don't know that that survey has been done. Um, that's certainly a good question because we'd like to work with the best healers possible. Those people who are able to do the healing uh, repeatedly. Um, that just makes it a lot easier for us to collect 
data from uh, a reliable effect. Um, the outcome, of course, is the most important thing. Uh, is there a healing going on? And in a lot of instances, we just don't know because we, uh, we don't follow the patients or the, their disease is, is so chronic. Uh, they may say they feel a little bit better, but um, I haven't uh, the resources right now to follow these patients over months or years, uh, which would be the ideal thing uh, to see if the healers are genuinely having, having an effect. Yeah. Do the healers and patients know each other? That is, were the patients the patients of these healers? I asked each healer to bring in, uh, on any given day, one patient they felt a strong rapport with, uh, in an attempt to try and maximize the coherence effect. Somebody they felt they could tune into and who was able to open up to them so that they could have a successful healing session. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, the ethnicity of the healers that you've been working with, uh, are, are, are they more from an Asian culture or, um, let's say, um, non-Western uh, worlds, or are they American or Caucasian? Or? Uh, all European. All European. All European, uh, all Caucasian so far. Uh, I haven't worked with uh, any indigenous healers um, just because these are the folks who were known in the community and responded to the ads or the, the word of mouth. Uh, I'm interested in working with all types of healers um, and, and once again trying to, to verify um, their success. I haven't recorded uh, respiration, um, but that's one of uh, an array of physiological signals that I would like to include. And ideally, I'd, I'd like uh, to record uh, four or five different biological signals, uh, the brain waves, the heartbeat, respiration, skin conductance, skin temperature. In addition, to having an array of energetic detectors around the healer and the patient at the same time. And that's what we hope to do starting this summer down at Duke, set up an array of uh, um, uh, electromagnetic spectrum and uh, magnetic energy detectors to see if we can pick up something energetically using photomultiplier tubes that are, are very sensitive to uh, particular frequencies, they can count a single photon. Your eye is sensitive to frequencies at a certain photon in the, in the light band and is one of the best detectors uh, known. But uh, we can also build uh, detectors made out of photomultiplier tubes that can detect single quanta coming off. Yes? Yes, I was just wondering, um, have you done any studies on acupuncture? Because I've used acupuncture on certain problems that I've had and I've noticed that certain things get turned off and then they get turned on again because I have certain types of problems and um, I've used acupuncture and I've used Reiki before and I was wondering whether you studied acupuncture because that's a form of healing also. It, it sure is and uh, it works very well for some people and there is work going on in acupuncture using functional MRI and in the past few years they've gotten some very interesting results. Um, at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, Joy Jones has been working in the Department of Radiology doing functional MRI studies and they showed some very interesting data where they stick acupuncture needles into points on the foot uh, and they're able to stimulate the brain. You can see the brain activated in this area uh, that's related to the foot. Yeah, like I said, I've had certain types of problems and I have, um, like I have depression and it turns it off and then it turns it on again and I've used it and it helps. It helps for a while, but then it flares up again and it's very strange. I don't know how it happens, but it comes back and it comes back a little stronger. So mm. I don't know how that happens. It works for a while. Yeah, the, Western medicine doesn't have a good explanation of, of acupuncture. Uh, it, it's still being debated, but there is a widespread agreement that the effect is real. 
and the National Institutes of Health is, is spending lots of money to try uh, to help investigators uh, find out what's going on. Um, some people think that there are nerve endings near these acupuncture points, very, very tiny, that uh, haven't shown up in, in the way the anatomy has been done before. Other people think they're lymph uh, um, uh, veins there uh, uh, as part of the lymph system. Um, but on the whole, the, the anatomy uh, and the, uh, the physiology of acupuncture is not that well understood. Um, are, are PET scans a useful tool to investigate these questions, to look at which parts of the brains are turned on and off? They, they could be, yes. Um, but the, this the problem with mag electromagnetic fields? I mean, I'm not sure exactly how they're done, but presumably you don't have this effect of thousands of gauss. Right. You avoid that, but the trade-off is that you get radioactive tracers injected into your body. So the person emits uh, radioactivity, which is uh, far more dangerous than exposure to uh, these magnetic fields and, and radio frequencies for nearly everybody. And you can't do repeat studies in a short period of time. If somebody gets a PET scan, then uh, you want to give their body plenty of time to recover before you dose them again. So functional MRI has become the tool of choice to use for repeat studies. Um, PET has one great advantage, though. If you want to study particular pathways, then you can construct uh, a chemical tracer that will go to certain pathways in the brain. So if you have an idea of where you want to look and you want to see uh, how that pathway is, is networked and connected, then, yeah, that PET would be good. Um, what is the objective of, of the scientific community to quantify this? You know, what, what, what is, once we do it, once we quantify it, once uh, it's proven. Yeah. Uh, and then how do you interface that with uh, the majority of healers that I've met tend to use the word spirituality or tend not to be. Most, I know some extremely amazing healers and most of them don't have an education past you know, high school. And, they they tend to think, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, that it's kind of spiritually based, and that it can't be quantified or understood, as you said initially, um, by science at, at its current state of development. Uh, but if, if you can find out how this healer is doing this, what what do you want to do with that? I mean, what yeah, you know, what's what's the objective? Yeah. If you say, well, aha, we found it, we found them. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I I, I ask that myself that question uh, frequently, uh, and I ask myself that question yesterday when I was preparing some of these uh, transparencies. You know, what's the point? Um, you know, a lot of the scientific community doesn't believe in this. Even if we could figure out uh, what the mechanism is, what's the benefit? And I, I think there are a couple ways of approaching the answer. One is that um, if you were able to figure out the mechanism, then you have the ability to Im to train people, to teach people how to um, use that mechanism uh, either to help others or themselves better. Um, we now know lots about how the body works and consequently we've developed all sorts of tools and pills and, uh, for uh, Im improving uh, people when they're sick. Um, and all the time we're discovering uh, what is basically common sense, you know, exercise and nutrition and uh, uh, friends uh, and uh, extroversion are, are all important characteristics of, of a person's life. Uh, that's, that's one part to the answer. So you could, you could train. It could be a great educational tool. It's also uh, a means of advancing science. As difficult as the concept of spirituality is for the scientific community to, to fathom, um, I believe that science will progress uh, in the future to the point where spirituality and science are, are on the same path. Science is a tool that is very powerful that can be used to put the spotlight on just about any question. And as the tools improve, um, we can 
uh, illuminate more and more of uh, what we focus on. So science can be used in uh, to help us understand what spirituality is all about and what our place here is in the universe is. Um, and, and thirdly, many of you are artists. And you know, I might ask you, um, why do you paint? Why do you sculpt? Why do you write? Uh, it's some sort of urging you have. And it's a way of uh, expressing yourself and expressing your creativity. Well, for those of us who are scientists, the same thing is true. This is our art. And it may be high tech to you, but some of what artists do is very high tech too. And this is just our expression, uh, our means of trying to understand our, our place in the universe. Yes. The healer and patient where you saw the activity on the functional uh, MRI, did either the healer or the patient report any difference between that session and the other session where they couldn't be replicated? I didn't ask the question, but they didn't report it. Um, Yes. Do you know how many coherent studies like this have been done with what I might term intimacy trance, like two lovers that are together and they're making out, uh, where there's an intimacy between them? Has, has it been looked for to see if that generates anything like this? Well, I've, I've heard some uh, anecdotal reports. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, not, not even so much sex studies. I mean, just like when you see a couple in the park and they're embracing and they're, you know. No, but I have an, another set of data I haven't started analyzing. Uh, because that was sort of a question that uh, arose in the course of doing this. You know, perhaps if you looked at not healers and patients, but people who were more in rapport, naturally, who would you want to study? Who would you want to study? And there are a couple groups that come to mind very quickly, and that's twins. Imagine two twin brains, very, very similar from the same egg, um, the same sperm, and they ought to be very similar. And what would the, their baseline level of coherence be? I would I suspect it would be higher, but I don't know. I'd very much like to do that. And lots of twins report that they feel like they're in telepathic contact with their twin. And a second group that comes naturally to mind, um, perhaps even more intimate than uh, lovers, are... Uh, nursing mothers and their babies. And so we did collect uh, a, a body of data uh, from nursing mothers and their babies using these sponge electrode caps. And I haven't gotten around to analyzing that, but I'm, I'm very intrigued about uh, what will come out of that. So that was done as uh, a core group of control people. Um, interested to see what uh, what sort of coherence effects we get from them. Yeah. Um, have you read uh, Phineas Quimby? He's a healer from 1848. He wrote this very long, it's actually in paperback, like a 900 page manuscript describing his healing technique. And he was very popular at the time and um, actually um, Mary Baker Eddy went to see him and he was apparently very effective as a healer. What he's describing, he keeps, I think he calls it something like entrainment. He, he puts the person into sort of a rapport with him and somehow, you know, it's, he, he does a lot of trying to describe it, but oddly enough, it sounds a little bit like what you're, you know, looking at. Mm -hmm. It might be interesting to take a look at his manuscript. Mm -hmm. Is that something you have here, Lisette? Yeah, I believe so. I've actually read it, and it's really heavy going. But but at the end, even though I could never repeat what I found out, I felt like he really described something that was very hard to describe, and you got a sense of it in a, in an interesting way. Uh, prayer when uh, people who are ill are prayed for. Uh, I think there have been some studies where if someone is being prayed for long distance they do better than a control group of people who are not prayed for. So would this be kind of like a long distance healing? Yes. How would you 
scientifically uh, validate something like that. I mean, you, you couldn't do MRIs when everybody was praying for this person, right? Well, the best way to validate it is to do an outcome study and look at the effect on the patients. And, and that's what a number of groups are doing. And there is significant funding from the National Institutes of Health to look at this, uh, this question right now. Because uh, a lot of people who are doing the praying are not psychic healers. You know, they're just regular people praying. So you know, what makes a, a spiritual healer is, is a spiritual healer kind of separate and apart from the rest of the, you know, the, the body politic, or do we all have that ability within us? I don't know the answer to that question, but I would suspect that it's sort of like a musician. I made the analogy earlier, you know, that to, to musicians, uh, gifted psychic healers are, are like uh, virtuosos. A violin player virtuosos like a Yehudi Menuhin, and there aren't many of those around. And there aren't that many gifted psychic healers either. And there's, so there's probably a spectrum of abilities, and the gifted healers are way out here, and most of the population. And maybe it's like a bell curve, and there's some people who have no ability at all, and there's some who have this huge ability out here, but most of us lie in the middle. Yes. Have you done any studies on music as a healing art or animals, for that matter? No. Are you interested in that? I am, but I only have so much time. I do this in my spare time. So this is not a full-time position. As much as I'd like it to be, uh, trying to find funds to do this is very, very difficult. Why is that difficult? Why is, why is the establishment uh, somehow uh, slowing down the process of work? choosing to uh, acknowledge it when you know and I know that it's exists. Well, there isn't that much money available from private foundations or from uh, the federal government. The federal government up until recently uh, would not touch this stuff. And it's only been in the past five or ten years that the National Institutes of Health has begun to seriously investigate alternative healing. Why are they seriously investigating it? And why, is the, why is there some money coming now? Seriously investigating it because of the revolution in healthcare and published reports back in the late 80s and early 90s indicating that up to 40 to 50 percent of the population was spending their money outside of conventional medicine. Hey, that's my question. Market driven. It's market driven. Very much. So now we're spending our money on Iraq, so first things first. But there are now a number of influential people in government, uh, including Congress who for years have successfully now pushed this to the point where there's a bureaucracy built up that hands out money for investigators who come up with good ideas. And what's important for getting the money is having good pilot data. And so that's what I'm trying to accumulate here. Sufficient pilot data so that we can interest the funding agencies to give us sufficient funds so we can do this full time. Stephen, and will you promise when you slog through some more, come back and give us an update on what you All know right. next time? Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Lisa Coley. I'm president of Parapsychology Foundation, so welcome to our YouTube channel. We have lots to look at, so please check out our videos. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.